uh, so I'll bring something here that was not brought till now. Uh, there, these animals, they move. So, and we can see them, and possibly you have already see, see, seen them very often, but possibly you won't recognize them just looking at my title. So, today I'm going to talk you about wood lice. They have several names depending on the country, or even inside a country they have several names. Uh, but they can be found uh, in soils, agriculture soils, near where people do agriculture activities, uh, growing animals, whatever they like to be near men. But they can also be found in wetlands. So that's why we used uh, these kind of organisms because they play a very important role uh, in soil ecosystems because they will be one of the first uh, organisms that will fragmentate the uh, organic matter that is present. So, in, in this uh, study that I will present you, um, we were based on uh, potential emission scenarios that can occur, that were uh, talked very widely here today. Uh, but, first criticism that can appear from all of you is that we use pristine nanoparticles. But we use pristine nanoparticles because we have to start from the beginning, as always. So there was nothing on these animals. We need to know how they react to silver. There was not even a clue on ionic silver, the effects of ionic silver. So we start first to try to understand what was around using uh, silver nanoparticles. The silver nanoparticles that we used um, are very small. Uh, they are between 3 and 8 nanometers and they were produced to be enclosed in fabrics. And they stick very well to the fabrics, and uh, the company that uh, produced them claims that if you wash those fabrics 50 times, they will move. So they are very uh, static in the fabrics. So why uh, also the isopods? Why did we want to use this model uh, organism is because they have spe special features. Um, they are terrestrial crustaceans, uh, so they are very similar to uh, shrimps, for instance, uh, and they have uh, special organs uh, that are called the hepatopancreas, where they can store granules. So some of these granules are already known for metallic granules like copper, or uh, sulfur, and they attach to these granules, and some of them, because they have two different uh, cell types in these granules, uh, some of them will stay there forever, and the other ones will just be, are excreted throughout uh, the day. So uh, we know that in uh, small cells, because there are one big cells, and there are uh, small cells that were called S and B cells, um, in these S cells, uh, there will be no elimination of uh, the, the granules. On the other side, B cells, we know that they are daily excreted. So one of the things we would like to know is if silver, when enters inside the organism, what happens? So will it be eliminated? Will it be going and deposit on the B cells? Or it will stick into the animals? And this way, it will increase the probability of being transferred throughout a traffic chain. So, mainly our objectives were first to uh, evaluate the toxicity, but then evaluate the uptake and the elimination kinetics of silver uh, in these organisms exposed to soil. We also uh, performed the same experience, but contaminated artificially some leaves so that we could compare also the, um, the roots of uptake. And mainly we want to respond to these three questions. So how toxic is silver to, to isopods? How fast they can be uptaken and also compare ionic forms versus um, the nanoparticle for, form? And also if the kinetics of these uh, silver forms are different or not. So 
this is our species, this is, as I told you, the, the nanoparticles that we used and uh, silver nitrate as a ionic control. Um, first, we uh, just perform an acute toxicity test, so our aim was to kill uh, the isopods within a concentration range and to calculate or to derivate the concentration that was killing 50% of our population. Then another approach that we used was um, what we call avoidance behavior tests that usually uh, these kind of soil organisms, they can detect, they have the ability to detect the presence of chemicals um, in soil. So for instance, earthworms have their whole body covered <coughs> by chemoreceptors that can identify the presence of uh, chemicals. And the isopods, you see here an antenna. On the tip of the antenna, they have similar chemoreceptors. So they can detect the presence of chemicals and run away if they have that possibility. So what we have done is that we have a chamber. We divide the chamber into uh, halves uh, virtually. Uh, we place in one of the, the parts of the chamber contaminated soil, in another part a controlled clean soil, and then we put some organisms here in the middle. We wait 48 hours and then we count how many organisms are in each of the sites. And usually when they detect a chemical, just, they just run away to the clean site. Then we perform a feeding inhibition test. We use here their function as a very ecological uh, endpoint. So uh, what we did is that expose them to contaminated soil and see if they decrease uh, their uh, feeding rate. And then we performed also those to tox toxicokinetic studies by exposing the organisms to two concentrations of uh, silver. So regarding the kinetic studies, what we do is that we have two uh, phases, an uptake phase and an elimination phase. The uptake phase, they will be exposed to contaminated soil. And then after that, we tra transfer the organisms to clean soil and see how can they eliminate uh, the chemical. So mainly what we will have is something like this. So you will have uh, sampling on time, you will have the body concentration uh, of the chemical that you are uh, working with. And mainly you see in time the concentration increasing inside the organisms. And then when you move them to a clean media, you see that if they can excrete the compound, these, uh, these values will decrease in time. So these were our uh, sampling points, just for you to have an idea. 21 days in each of the, the, the phases that we used. Um, usually we just had uh, more close sampling uh, times in the beginning because they tend to accumulate faster in, in, on the first days of exposure. And we sacrifice three isopods per sampling time because we don't want to kill them all. <laughs> so then we just use some kinetic models uh, that are uh, established already, and we will calculate uh, several parameters. So the first um, compartment model that we use is a one compartment model where simply you calculate the uptake constant and the elimination constant based on, on what is changing inside the organism in time. But considering that these organisms can have an inert fraction that is uh, located on the hepatopancreas, on the cells that I told you about, we also used and test this uh, one compartment model that uh, we fixed uh, an inert fraction inside of the organisms. Uh, and we saw that this was the best model when we compared to this one. We compared both models in terms of feeding, and this was the one that was presenting a best fit to our data. Then, 
we calculate a, bio, a bioaccumulation factor, that is the ratio between the uptake constant and the elimination constant. There are other ways of calculating this bioaccumulation factor, that is simply by dividing the concentration uh, inside your organism by the concentration that you expose the organism to. So if there is a bioaccumulation factor higher than one, you, you see that the, there, there is a, a magnification of the, the concentration on the compartments you are comparing. So imagine if I, I have a, a BAF higher than one, then your concentration inside your organism will be higher than the one you had in the soil in terms of weight. So one thing, just going to the, the results section, the first thing we tried to do was to characterize our exposures. And we know that characterization in natural waters is dif difficult because it's considered difficult due to the uh, components that can be present. Now imagine soil. So we just put some nanoparticles in soil. We didn't use the concentrations of the exposure uh, that we use for the toxicity test. We had to increase them so we could see uh, some nanoparticles. And what we did uh, it was just we contaminated the soil. We had an equivalent volume of water. We sonicated for 30 seconds, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, the mixture. Uh, and then with a pipette, we remove 20 microliters of the elutriate and spike the uh, grids so we could have these TEM images. So this one here is the unspiked soil. So pictures were taken disregarding all those big uh, particles that were really from soil. So uh, this one here was uh, one picture that uh, came from an unspiked soil. They could not see any uh, silver nanoparticles present. Then, although I am not showing here, they could have also uh, found any particles uh, for the ionic silver that we spiked the soil, for the silver nitrate. But then we could find some nanoparticles in the um, soil spiked with, with our uh, silver nanoparticles. So you can see here some uh, grouping of the nanoparticles with the organic layer surrounding them. Uh, but also here there is also uh, or some nanoparticles put together. So we could at least see them in the elutriates that we uh, collected from the exposure soils. So our first results from the toxicity test, this was very interesting because when we finalized this data, we met with Jason and Ryan, but he was already mentioned here, and they had exactly the same results for earthworms. So our isopods behaved exactly the same as the, the, the earthworms, and they could detect the presence of silver in both, uh, nano, uh, in both forms in, at several uh, concentrations, the highest ones that we have here, and the uh, concentration that was derived that sh showed 50% uh, of the isopods running away from, from the silver contaminated soil was similar in both forms. So you can see here that at this concentration of the silver nanoparticles, 18, they were running away, half of them were running away from the contaminated soil. Regarding the, the silver nitrate, near by 15 milligrams per kilogram, they were also running away. So this was quite similar in terms of response uh, when we look at silver nanoparticles or their ionic particles. Then for the consumption uh, ratio, so just for you to have a, um, an idea what we did, contaminated the soil, provide them some leaves that they like, and see, uh, and we saw how, how, how uh, was their feeding rate. So 
what we saw was there was a clear dose response curve for the nan nanoparticle uh, silver. Uh, it was not so evident when we exposed them to the ionic silver, but they ended up with the same response at similar uh, concentrations. So um, we found that there were effects around 150 milligrams per kilo, so this test was not so uh, sensitive as the avoidance behavior test, but their function in soil was starting to be affected around more or less similar concentrations of both forms. Also, we got a good response in terms of biomass, where isopods um, showed that although they start feeding less, they were also losing some weight in terms of body weight. So uh, we could see that increasing the concentrations of silver, the, the, their difference between their weight from the beginning of the experiment and the end of the experiment was also uh, decreasing. Here I'm showing also the relationship betwe between what was the exposure concentrations and what were the body burdens of the isopods at the end of the experiment. So you can see here uh, that uh, they could accumulate a little bit more uh, silver uh, when we expose them to nanoparticles than when we expose them to, to silver nitrate. So all these that I told you here you can find on this uh, paper that was published this year. But of course, if you have some questions, I can answer you. So now going for the toxicokinetic studies and looking at the model that we used uh, and looking at the, the, the lowest concentration used, um, you can see that in both forms, they look very similar. So there was an accumulation rate similar and then almost no elimination. So this uh, shows that the, the that good lives, that isopods, they are not able to eliminate silver after uh, the silver is inside their body. So the, the kinetics uh, generate uh, these, these values here for the uptake, for the elimination, and for the uh, bioaccumulation factor, which were similar in both cases, although the uptake uh, constant was not similar, they were compensated also, sorry, also by the, the, the elimination rates. So then we end up with a bioaccumulation factor that was similar. <coughs> if we increase a little bit the, the concentrations, the pattern is very similar. If you look at the curves, they are also similar to the other ones. And the K values are much more similar than the other ones, but they provided by accumulation factors a little bit different. Although uh, we cannot say that they are different because the K1 and the K2 are very similar. So we can conclude from here that both forms, they will behave inside the organisms in a similar way. So our first conclusion was that silver can be detected by isopods at low concentrations, as I told you, similarly to earthworms, uh, and with a similar response between the ionic and the nanoparticle form. Uh, so these were, as far as we know, the lowest effective concentrations that were calculated for soil organisms along with the earthworms uh, in the, the avoidance behavior tests. Uh, and when we try to see how fast uh, silver nanoparticles can be accumulated by isopods, they will provide a fast accumulation, so they accumulate very fast. And there is a similar pattern in terms of accumulation and elimination between the two forms. And as there was 
almost no elimination of, of silver uh, from the kinetics, we hypothesized that the S cells in the hepatopancreas was the place where this uh, metal would be localized. So just quickly, we uh, send some wood lice to the synchrotron, and here is a, micros a light microscope <coughs> of the, the cells from, from the wood lice. There here are the small cells, here are the big cells, and here are the results from the synchrotron. So you see that sulfur uh, are located more or less here, copper are located uh, in the S cells, and silver is located more or less in the same place. So silver was mainly located in the S cells of the wood lice. That's why they didn't went for an elimination process. So they stick there, and they, they are not uh, eliminated. So this will bring a problem in terms of trophic transfer, because they cannot eliminate this uh, metal in a dionic form or in the particulated form. So just to finalize, this is the PhD work of Paula, my student. She will end up the, the PhD in December. And these are also the two people that collaborate in this work, Amadeus Swartz and Kevin Gestel from uh, the VU University in Amsterdam. So thank you very much.